Welcome and good afternoon. I am Natalie Naylor. I will be presenting this program in a few minutes. Uh, I am the immediate past president of the Nassau County Historical Society and I'm editor of its annual journal. I was, am a retired professor from Hofstra University at, where I taught American social history and I was also director of its Long Island Studies Institute for 15, for the first 15 years. The best years, we had 21 conferences and 30 books that got published in those years. Let me say something though about the organization that is sponsoring this program. Uh, the Nassau County Historical Society is an all volunteer organization. We usually have presented six programs a year. This is our fifth this year because we're not in normal times. In the past and in the future, I hope we will meet in East Williston, which is a central location when we are able to have in-person services, uh, uh, programs. Uh, this program was originally scheduled for June before the uh, centennial of the final ratification of the 19th Amendment for Women's Suffrage. It was postponed because of the pandemic and is now a Zoom webinar uh, before the end of the suffrage centennial year. We will be starting with a very brief survey about how you heard about this meeting. Uh, so Dave, if you will put that up. And Okay, are we ready? This is my first Zoom webinar presentation, so I hope all goes well. I have some confidence because trustee Dave Doucette is our engineer, and I'm going to try to stick to my notes because otherwise I might still be talking at five o'clock uh, if I start to add and live too much. So let's go, I hope. And why is, there we go. I like this picture because it shows Stanton uh, younger than she's often seen. Um, women's suffrage movement started in, at a tea party in upstate New York. That was in 1848. Uh, but for eight years earlier in 1840, was the world's anti-slavery convention in London, where Elizabeth Cady Stanton first met Lucretia Mott. Uh, Mott and her husband James were delegates to the convention. James Mott grew up in uh, Sands Point here on Long Island, uh, but his wife became so well known that sometimes he was known as Mr. Lucretia. Mott. I should mention that our website has a handout that you can download later if you didn't do it in advance. And it lists some of the basic facts and people. And there's also a bibliography there. I will be focusing on the Long Island women in camp campaigns, but I am starting, as you probably have realized, with the uh, national. In 1840, when Lucretia Mott uh, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton met, um, Cady Stanton was 25 years old. She was newly married. Her husband, Henry Stanton, like the two Motts, was a delegate to the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention. 
And women were active in the anti-slavery movement, but the London Convention would not seat Lucretia Mott. So she had to sit in the balcony with Katie Stanton. They became very good friends and resolved to do something about the situation of women when they returned to the United States. But family responsibilities intervened for them both. And it wasn't until 1848 that they met again uh, in uh, Seneca Falls uh, area. Uh, Stanton now had three young children. She would eventually have seven. Um, living in the Finger Lakes area, upstate New York, as I said, Seneca Falls, Lucretia Mott was in the area for a Quaker meeting and they met for tea in nearby Waterloo. Three other women who like Mott was, were Quakers and they decided to call as they put the ad in the paper said, uh, a convention to discuss the social, civil and religious rights of women. Uh, it was to be the next week and they were meeting in the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls. Uh, the first time I visited in Seneca Falls, uh, this building was a laundromat. Um, though there was a plaque on the side of the building that indicated it had been the site of the 1848 convention. And what Katie Stanton proposed was a declaration of sentiments modeled on the 1776 Declaration of Independence, beginning when in the course of human events and on to we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And the first of the repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man towards women was, and I quote, he has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. And one of the 20 resolutions stated, it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. When Lucretia Mott first heard that, she said, oh, Lizzie, that will make us look ridiculous. We must go slowly. Katie's husband, Henry Stanton, threatened to leave town if she left it in. She left it in and she, he left town that day. The women asked James Mott to preside at the convention, which attracted more than 300 women and men. And these statues, it, as it says, are in the um, visitor center at the Women's Rights National Park, in Seneca Falls, together with uh, uh, representations of others attending that uh, convention. That convention, that day was the last time that a man presided at one of the women's rights conventions. Women presided subsequently. And all of the resolutions passed unanimously except the one for the vote. Frederick Douglass, the abolitionist, uh, ex-slave, uh, spoke in support of it and it passed by a narrow margin. 67 women and 32 men signed the declaration. And that convention was the beginning of the organized woman's suffrage movement in America. Amy Post, a Long Island Quaker who had moved to Rochester, attended that meeting in Seneca Falls. She signed the declaration. She was on the committee to publish its proceedings. Her family, you have Post Avenue and Westbury, named for that family. Well, soon Stanton was joined by Susan B. Anthony, um, who was not at Seneca Falls, uh, Anthony was involved in the temperance movement uh, against liquor. Uh, Anti-slavery and temperance were concerns of Stanton, Anthony, and many other women reformers. But suffrage was much more radical. And these women, so let's get there. Uh, Stanton, Anthony, and Lucretia Mott worked tirelessly for suffrage the rest of their long lives. This portrait monument statue in Washington, D.C. has sometimes derisively been called 
three women in a bathtub. Uh, the government uh, put it in the basement of the Capitol. And in the 1990s, uh, it was moved to a more prominent location, but women had to raise the money in order to move it. And I should mention here that in England, the term that was usually used in the, in the suffrage movement was suffragette. Uh, that was the title perhaps you saw the film a few years ago. And originally that was a, uh, applied derisively and the women in England adopted that term proudly. Suffragette in America usually implied uh, greater militancy. The English suffragettes were much more militant than, and radical than the Americans. Uh, I'm ignoring those differences. I'm gonna use the term suffragist for all of the women here. Some of the militant Americans had earlier worked in England and that was true of Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch, of Ro Rosalie Jones, Lucy Burns, and Alice Paul, whom I'll be mentioning at least a bit later. And there were many different suffrage organizations. And if you downloaded that handout, uh, you can find some of those in the timeline of dates. Uh, Susan B. Anthony is not a Long Islander. She was born in Adams in Western Massachusetts. As an adult, she lived in Rochester, New York, in Western New York. Both of her homes are now museums. Anthony came to Long Island, uh, in, in, to Jamaica specifically, and Riverhead in 1894 to speak and to collect signatures for a state suffrage amendment. She visited every county in the state. She collected more than 332,000 signatures, but the measure lost. They only got one third of the votes in New York State's Constitutional Convention that year. Other uh, instances of these leading suffragists being in, in Long Island, Elizabeth Cady Stanton visited her son in the 1890s in the summer homes that he rented in Hempstead, Glen Cove, and Great Neck. She visited her daughter, Margaret, in Shoreham, where Stanton wrote her memoir, 80 Years and More, and that's still a wonderful introduction uh, to the suffrage movement and to Stanton in particular. I'm told that every child who came to the Stanton home in Shoreham was taught to say, I believe in votes for women. Uh, but other than those few instances, uh, on Long Island, suffrage activities were nearly invisible until the 1910s. Uh, but Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, uh, and Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony <coughs> each lived well into their 80s. Anthony was the last to die in 1906. It was time for the next uh, generation, the second generation of leaders. And one of those was uh, Stanton's daughter, Harriet. Um, and I will speak more about her and her granddaughter, uh, Nora, uh, whom you see in this uh, three generation picture here. I'm skipping over national events listed in the timeline to focus on Long Island. And a chronological account is difficult because almost all the Long Island women were involved in the same half dozen years in the 1910s, different positions and different organizations. So I'll speak about the roles of individual women that I listed on uh, the main women in, on the handout under the heading local, state, and national leaders with Long Island connections. And on that list, they're in alphabetical order by their surname. And one of the first was, and well known, Ida Bunn Samus organized the first woman suffrage organization in Suffolk County in her hometown of Huntington. The Political Equality League was affiliated with the mainstream state and national suffrage organizations. Samus had been active in the temperance movement, specifically the Women's Christian Temperance Union or the WCTU. 
which under Francis Willard became active in suffrage and added thousands of women to the cause. Uh, but it also meant that the wicker industry spent a fortune opposing suffrage. They were afraid that if women secured the vote, they would prohibit the sale of alcoholic beverages. But when the 18th Amendment enacting prohibition was ratified in 1919, it removed that obstacle to women's suffrage. But back to Ida Samus. In Huntington, the parlor meetings of the Political Equality League in Samus's home included a broader agenda. For example, the Political Equality League also worked for sanitary conditions in schools. They ended the common drinking cups. They used paper rather than cloth towels. After suffrage was secured in New York State in 1917, Samus ran for the New York State Assembly in 1918. She, um, uh, she ran on the prohibition and uh, Republican parties and uh, defeated a four-term incumbent in the primary. Uh, Samus was one of two, the first two women in New York to be elected to the state assembly. And among her acts, the first acts that she did or first uh, things she did was polishing the cuspidor or the spittoon that was by her seat and filling it with ferns. 10 of the 14 bills that she introduced were successful. I think that must be a record for, especially for a freshman assembly person. Uh, one of those equalized pay for men and women in state hospitals doing the same work. And that was important for doctors, nurses, and aides at Long Island's large state mental hospitals in Central Islip, Kings Park, and Pilgrim State in Brentwood. And Samus is credited with the success of a bill regulating hours for women elevator or operators. She ran for reelection in uh, 1919, but was defeated. So she only served one term. And at that time, terms were only one year. But her groundbreaking equal pay legislation foreshadowed one of today's critical issues. Samus outlived three husbands, so she's sometimes referred to Ida Bunce Samus Woodruff Satchwell. Her home on Main Street in Huntington survives, and a roadside marker was erected there last year. Many of the suffrage oh. leaders on Long Island were wealthy women from New York who had country homes on the island. They had the time and leisure, thanks to servants, to spend time on suffrage. I like to call them the socialite suffragists. An author of a recent book called them Gilded Suffragists. And one of those was Margaret Olivia or Mrs. Russell Sage, who had country homes in Lawrence and Sag Harbor. Uh, today, her Greek revival home in Sag Harbor is the Whaling Museum. Uh, her home in Lawrence no longer survives. But this is the cover of a biography of, of, uh, of Sage, uh, 1921 portrait of her. Uh, after her husband died, Sage became a prominent philanthropist and she was also a suffragist. In fact, she was converted to suffrage when Elizabeth Cady Stanton visited her at her summer home in Lawrence in the Five Towns area of Nassau County. Sage is one of the early socialite suffragists and was, as someone has called her, a celebrity suffrage patroness. Sage joined Catherine Mackey, who had a country home in Roslyn. Mackey organized the Equal Franchise Society in New York City in 1908. And like Sage, contributed significant amounts of money to the cause. Incidentally, <clears throat> Mackey was elected to the Roslyn School Board in 1905. Women could vote in country school districts in New York State in nine, from 1880. Uh, Mackey in 1910 um, ran away to Paris with her husband's uh, doctor, leaving her three children behind, and that was quite a scandal. 
She eventually divorced Clarence uh, and married the doctor. So she dropped out of the suffrage movement, but not before she had introduced Alva Vanderbilt Belmont to the suffrage cause. When she was married to William K. Vanderbilt, Alva lived at Idle Hour in Oakdale. Until recently, that was the home of Dowling College. But after getting accepted in New York society, Alva divorced Vanderbilt in 1895 and married Oliver Hazard Perry Belmont. You may have visited a marble house in Newport uh, that Alva built. And after OHP Belmont died in 1908, Alva became involved in suffrage. She started the Political Equality Association in New York City. She paid rent for rooms on Fifth Avenue for that organization and for the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which was the largest suffrage organization. A recent biographer has estimated that Belmont's contributions to suffrage were the equivalent <clears throat> of more than $10 million today. And Belmont had, besides her mansion in New York City, she had two homes on Long Island. This Disney-esque um, home at the tip of Sands Point no longer survives. Um, she had suffrage meetings there and at Brook Holt uh, in East Meadow. Again, this does not survive. Um, but she organized the Brook Holt branch of the Political Equality Association here in 1911. She sent speakers to meetings to put Long Island on the map, as she said. And she even had a suffrage farm on her property in East Meadow for two years. Uh, she abandoned it when she thought the, the girls weren't taking it seriously they, uh, or wearing high heel shoes and such. Well, Belmont was important in the more radical wing of the suffrage movement. She continued to support the National Woman's Party in the 1920s and donated a, their headquarters in Washington, DC. They had to move to a new location. Uh, the Sewell Belmont House and Museum still survives. And in 2016, President Obama proclaimed it the Belmont Paul Women's Equality National Monument. And Alice Paul's name was added to the site. Paul is under the national leaders in, if you have the handout. She was a founder of the Women's Party, author of the Equal Rights Amendment in 1923, but alas, uh, was from New Jersey, but not Long Island. Uh, but like Mott and many others in the movement was a Quaker. Um, Paul's second in command was Lucy Burns from Brooklyn. And so depending on how you, you judge, she's a Long Islander and certainly was regarded as such at the time. Um, and her claim to fame is that she spent more time in jail than any of the other suffragists. I'll talk in a bit about uh, why they were spending time in jail. Um, my favorite local suffragist is Rosalie Gardner Jones. And I've used different terms, different times to describe her, her maverick, radical, unconventional. Someone called her eccentric. I think that's a bit harsh. Um, in a family, her niece whom I met uh, said she was always admonished when she was growing up, don't be like your aunt Rosalie. But Mary Jones grew up to admire her aunt and had quite a career herself. Rosalie Gardner Jones was born in New York City, but her family had deep roots on Long Island. Her mother, Mary Jones, inherited Jones Manor in the Cold Spring Harbor area in 1882. And after that house burned down in uh, 1909, she built this 125,000 square foot concrete house on her property. Uh, and Rosalie lived in these homes in her early and later years. 
And this house still stands in today's Laurel Hollow, just west of the Suffolk uh, board, Nassau border. Rosalie was a socialite, but as a suffragist, she rebelled against that background. She traveled in the United States and Europe, where she first encountered women's suffrage activities in England. And once home in 1911, she placed suffrage signs and slogans prominently on land that she owned in Syosset. She began to speak for suffrage, initially in Roslyn and then in New York City, joining with Alba Belmont and Harriet Stanton Blatch, who was Katie Stanton's daughter. And uh, Jones joined Elizabeth Freeman on a 1912 uh, tour of Long Island in a horse-drawn suffrage wagon, which you see here with the names of states that had adopted suffrage for women on it. Um, Freeman had been born in England she came to Long Island as a child, returned to England as an adult, worked as a speaker, organizer, and coordinator of the British Women's Social and Political Union from 1905 to 1911 before returning to the United States. Rosalie Jones was president of the Nassau County branch of the National American Woman's Suffrage Association. That's quite a, quite a mouthful, NASA are the initials. Um, she was Rosalie Jones, president of the NASA branch from 1912 to 1913. But her claim to fame was that she organized a hike from New York City to Albany in 1912, December 1912, to gain publicity and to present suffrage petitions to the governor. Rosalie's mother, Mary and her sister Louise were members of the New York Anti-Suffrage Association. Um, and her mother tried to prevent Rosalie from making the hike. Her mother said it was ridiculous and absolutely foolish. And here we see Rosalie um, on the first day of that hike. You see the drummer there as well behind her. I think that drum broke. Uh, the first day, but here's the line. They had a couple hundred women leaving from Van Cortlandt Park at the end of the subway line in the Bronx. Um, they had war correspondents or reporters, a commissary wagon with food and supplies. Uh, they carried boats for women banners, yellow knapsacks or tote bags. And you'll see some of that here with the um, um, uh, yellow was the suffrage color, and Jones um, appointed herself the general, um, her second in command, Colonel Ida Kraft uh, from Brooklyn in the center here. And this is the petition that they were carrying to uh, Governor Saltz, Governor Alex Holzer, signed by heads of New York City suffrage organizations, including Nora Blatch, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's granddaughter. Um, I'll speak more about her uh, later. That hike took uh, 12 days to cover more than 150 miles. There were a number of detours uh, to distribute leaflets and to make speeches. Uh, there were only five women, including Jones, who walked the full distance, and that included Kraft as well. Uh, others and some men would join for portions of the march. And this was December. They encountered rain, cold, snow, in fact, a blizzard. But the hike or pilgrimage, as they like to call it, attracted so much attention, so much publicity, that General Jones announced a march from New York to Washington, D.C. in February to present a suffrage petition to President-elect Whoops, let's go back. President-elect Woodrow Wilson. And this is the suffrage army. <clears throat> I think this is probably posing in Central Park beforehand when they were practicing, but they started in Newark. Uh, they covered more than 250 miles in just over two weeks. And this time the, the hikers wore brown pilgrim capes with hoods. 
If I were giving this in June, I might have been wearing my pilgrim uh, cloak, but uh, I've got to settle for votes for women uh, uh, sash today. Um, that height garnered even more publicity and many photographs survive of that hike. And you can even see some um, film in fact of it as well. This is when they are in Washington, I believe, Rosalie in the middle carrying the banner. Ida Kraft is always uh, visible, uh, recognizable. And here uh, again, Rosalie Jones, <coughs> She became a celebrity. And this cartoon I love, um, it was modeled, she hoped to cross the Delaware reenacting Washington's uh, feet crossing um, in, during the Revolutionary War. And this was based on, of course, Leutz's painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, I think there was too much ice in the river, so she wasn't actually able to do it but I love the cartoon nonetheless. And they join the uh, suffrage parade in the Capitol, which was the day before Wilson's inaugural. Uh, and when president elect Wilson arrived at the train station, he was surprised there were only a few people there to welcome him. And he said, where are all the people? They were all over watching, watching the suffrage parade. Um, Rosalie Jones martyrs uh, may have been relegated to the end of the parade. Um, the mainstream suffrage organization was jealous. They were getting so much publicity. Uh, should have a better picture than that. But at any rate, the point here is notice her megaphone. And in 1917, if you voted, uh, you got this sticker uh, with Rosalie's picture on it, the artist just reversed the image. Um, I'll go back, you can see it. There she is. There's the publicity. There was almost a riot in Washington with the parade that day. Um, Joan seemed tireless when she got back from Washington. She uh, organized and conducted a series of parades or pageants as she, they were called, the suffrage parade. Um, in July, she had a 10 day votes for women campaign traveling in a yellow horse-drawn wagon. And in September, she arranged an all night suffrage aviation and encampment meeting at the Hempstead Plains aviation field in Garden City. Uh, many flights, were canceled because of the rain, but some 50 women slept in one of the hangars. Uh, and another time she flew over Staten Island, dropping suffrage leaflets at a time when airplane flying was dangerous. Uh, Jones organized another hike to Albany in 1914 up the west side of the river. She campaigned for suffrage in several states in the Midwest. And the next year spoke on suffrage on Long Island campaigned in New Jersey and New York City. Apparently dropped out of suffrage activities after the defeat of the 1915 suffrage referendum in New York, focused on continuing her own education. Governor Cuomo announced in 1917, that a, 1917, 2017, that a statue of her would be erected in Cold Spring Harbor State Park in front of the Cold Spring Harbor Library. That was supposed to happen this year. Last I heard it's scheduled for 2021. I would love to show you a picture of that statue, but I can't. Um, another wealthy Long Island suffragist was Harriet Burton Laidlaw, who grew up in Albany, moved to New York City, taught high school English until she married James Lee's Laidlaw in 1905. The Laidlaws lived in New York City and had a country home in Sands Point on the North Shore of Long Island, Nassau County. Harriet Laidlaw became the Manhattan Suffrage Chairman in 1909 and later was Vice Chairman of the State Woman Suffrage Party 
and also an officer of the National American Woman Suffrage Party from 1911 to 1920. Laidlaw was a founding member of the Port Washington Woman's Suffrage League in 1913. She headed the successful 1917 suffrage referendum campaign in Nassau County. And all of Laidlaw's activities uh, in suffrage were with the mainstream organization, NASA, or its affiliates. And she opposed more militant approaches. She wrote a suffrage handbook, Organizing to Win, toured with her husband in the West for suffrage, campaigned by automobile on Long Island, distributing suffrage leaflets, and marched in suffrage parades in New York City. And her biographer has called her an eloquent speaker, an indefatigable worker, and a conscientious lieutenant for suffrage. But perhaps even more famous than she was her husband, uh, James, who was a banker, prominent in the New York Men's League for Women's Suffrage, organizer and president of the National Men's League for Women's Suffrage from 1912 to 1920. And the late law daughter remembers that males heckled what they called the shrieking sisterhood marching in suffrage parades, but that her father and other men in the parades endured the loudest boos and catcalls. The daughter donated a banner Laidlaw had carried in one of the suffrage parades to the Port Washington Library. And the banner proclaimed, and I quote, in deeds of daring rectitude, in scorn of miserable aims that end in self, close quote. That's a quote from a poem by George Eliot, and it is also on her gravestone. It is interesting that James Laidlaw is named on a national honor roll, as well as on this New York State honor roll right here. Uh, Harriet Laidlaw, his wife, is only on the state honor roll, um, not the national one. Um, and I'm sure you can't read those, all those names, but the handout has an asterisk by the Long Island uh, women who are on the plaque, uh, women and men. There's a recent book, uh, Suffragettes, How Women Used Men to Get the Vote by Brooke Kroger that indicates the important role that James Laidlaw and other men had in achieving uh, women's woman suffrage. And another Long Island man who was important uh, was Theodore Roosevelt who supported suffrage, uh, women's suffrage, after, not during his presidency, but after he became the candidate of the Progressive Party, the Bull Moose Party in 1912. And our members uh, will get, uh, will, will receive the Society's Journal. I have a brief article on um, Theodore Roosevelt's support of suffrage in that 2020 journal. There were many less uh, famous women involved in suffrage uh, movement on Long Island, whose families were middle class rather than wealthy socialites. And one of those women, an important one, Edna Kearns, um, who was a publicist for suffrage. She wrote and edited articles for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And in those days, the, that paper covered all of Long Island and that was, that has been available uh, digitized for quite a few years now. So that's a wonderful source. Kearns toured Long Island in this, what she was called the Spirit of 76 Wagon. Um, it was given to the state suffrage organization in 1913 and Kearns used it for several years campaigning. And Irene Davison is another one of the local suffragists. Um, it had her granddaughter, uh, Kern's granddaughter donated this to the New York State Museum in Albany, where it has been exhibited a number of times. And automobiles were also used in campaigning for suffrage. And this is Edna Kern's uh, in uh, a car for the country, Mineola Country Fair, a county fair. Um, so, 
this is my commercial for Antonia Petrish's book on Long Island and the woman's suffrage movement. Um, and this is, uh, you, you can get, this book is still available, certainly. And the news girls that you see pictured here are selling uh, copies of the woman's journal at the Suffolk County Fair. Remember I showed this picture earlier with Stanton's daughter Harriet and Harriet Stanton Latch, his youngest, younger daughter, uh, this as an infant, but Latch became uh, Stanton's uh, political disciple in the suffrage movement. She traveled in Europe and married an Englishman, William Blatch in 1882, lived outside London for two decades uh, where she was involved with the Thavian Society and uh, militant English suffrage activities. Harriet and her husband returned permanently to the United States in 1902. They lived in Shoreham Estates on Long Island, a summer community. And Blatch has written that she found the suffrage movement completely in a rut in New York State. She organized what became the Women's, Women's Political Union, began holding street meetings and parades in New York City. And those were controversial at the time. Uh, they became um, popular, respectable, though initially thought too radical and unfeminine. Uh, but the parades gained uh, increasing numbers participating each year. And Blatch also focused on lobbying legislators in Albany and targeting suffrage opponents for defeat in elections. At the 1914 uh, Suffolk County Fair in Riverhead, Blatch's Women's Political Union had speakers and distributed literature. And you'll see over here, one of those news girls like you saw on um, the, the cover of Antonia Petrish's book. Um, same uniform. Uh, at the fair, the women notice, whoops, let me go back, uh, child, free child care, and that attracted a lot of people. Um, very popular. And, it, and there, there apparently was one family whose uh, the husband thought the wife was picking up their child and vice versa. And the women took care, had to take care of them uh, overnight because neither of them came. And that converted the man to suffrage, so it was worth it, I guess. So here we have next three generations of the uh, Stanton, Blatch, and uh, her daughter Nora. You saw this before. Um, Blatch worked closely with Alva Belmont, Alice Paul, and the radical wing of the suffrage movement. And after the defeat of New York State's 1915 suffrage referendum, 57% of the men voted against it. Of course, only men could vote. Uh, then Blatch turned to her attention to campaigning in Washington, D.C. and the West, where she worked with Alice Paul and the Women's Party. And Blatch was popular throughout the country, both as the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and in her own right as well. And her biographer calls Blatch, the, and I quote, the chief strategist of the woman suffrage movement in the largest and most important state in the union, uh, as well as the senior stateswoman in the campaign that produced the 19th amendment. So that the largest state of course then was New York. And here's the baby grown up, Nora Blatch Barney. Um, she graduated from Cornell with a degree as a civil engineer and was also involved in suffrage, though not as high profile in the suffrage movement as her mother and grandmother. But earlier I had mentioned that she had signed the suffrage petition that Rosalie Jones brought on her hike to Albany. Nora married Lee DeForest, divorced him because he objected to her having a career. She became an architect and developer on Long Island, designed a house in Shoreham Estates for her mother, Harriet Blatch, which still stands. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton lived in Shoreham also, as well as her daughter for a number of years. The final 
Long Island woman I want to discuss, Louisine Havemeyer, another of the socialite suffragists, if you will. She had a country home in uh, Iceland, became active in suffrage after her husband died in 1907. And Havemeyer joined Blatch in the Radical Women, Woman's Party. Harriet Stanton Blatch convinced Havemeyer that she could speak in public. And we forget today how intimidating it was, especially at that time for women, although public speaking is still feared by many women and men today. Well, the Havemeyers were art collectors and she had exhibits of her cassette and other impressionist paintings to raise money for suffrage, besides contributing money herself. The nearly 2000 paintings from her collection were later donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. When suffrage parades were no longer attracting attention, Blatch asked Havemeyer if she would go on a 10 day speaking tour upstate in 1915. East Hampton suffragist May Manson brought her the torch, which you see here from Montauk and Havemeyer carried it in her car to Buffalo, averaging seven speeches a day at arranged stops. And she later toured in New Jersey with the torch and she gave it over, passing the suffrage torch. And after that, she commissioned another torch. I, I love this, an 18 inch long ship of state, which lit up with 33 battery powered lights. And her motto for it was no light where there is no freedom. In 1917, Havemeyer participated in picketing at the White House and in a demonstration which burned an effigy of President Wilson. The, those were activities organized by Alice Paul, Lucy Burns and the militants. And Havemeyer was arrested for obstruct, obstructing traffic was the charge they uh, brought on the women. She was one of any, a number of women arrested. And Havemeyer at that time was 67 or 68 years old, a gutsy woman, I say. Uh, her family was not terribly happy about what she was doing, but she was on uh, this prison special train of suffragists who had served time in prison. And they received uh, a, a pin. This is about two inches high or so. Um, that um, is a replica, of a, as you can see, of a prison jail door. Um, and you these replicas, I guess, are available. Are, I know are available because I had one. Okay, so to carry through, Carrie Chapman Cap became president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association in 1916, a New Yorker, but not a Long Islander, aided by the more militant tactics of Harriet Blatch, Alice Paul, Lucy Burns in their women's party, achieved the vote for women in New York State in 1917 when the statewide suffrage referendum was finally successful in both Nassau County and in the state, 54% voted in favor of women's suffrage. New York was the largest state, the first in the East to win votes for women. That was an important victory on the road to achieving national suffrage. And this map shows um, the, the ratification of the 19th amendment um, and you can see it's the South that never acted on the amendment or, or some of the South that rejected it. Um, and suffrage amendment barely secured the necessary two thirds vote in both houses of Congress on June 4th, 1919. They had a year or so earlier gotten the votes in the House of Representatives and it was the Senate that was the problem and particularly Southern senators. Um, 12 days later, uh, New York legislature ratified the federal amendment, but ratification by the necessary two thirds of the states was not easy. Some states had partial suffrage for women where they could vote in some elections, but not others. And 
several Southern states voted against it because they feared it would mean black women voting. And it finally came down to Tennessee uh, where victory was, uncert was uncertain. Harry Byrne, the youngest legislator at 24, changed his position uh, on suffrage after getting a letter from his mother. And she wrote him, be a good boy, among other things, the letter goes on for several pages, but be a good boy, help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. And he later said, I know a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow. And my mother wanted me to vote for suffrage. So the 19th Amendment was ratified by the two thirds of the states in August 1920, extended the vote to women nationwide. And this year, that centennial was recognized by a stamp in August uh, of the uh, 19th Amendment, uh, extended the vote to women nationwide. Um, Mississippi was the last state to ratify the amendment in 1984. The women uh, there were able to vote since 1920, or at least white women. Uh, most black women and men in the South had to wait until the Voting Rights Act in 1965 in order to vote. And Native Americans, uh, Indians, and, and Chinese Americans also did not get the vote in 1920. Uh, NASA re dissolved in 1920, having achieved its goal. And as I've mentioned, CAP established the League of Women Voters in 1920. Alice Paul continued the Women's Party and proposed an Equal Rights Amendment introduced in Congress initially in 1923. And in the 1970s, there were increased efforts. The ERA Amendment passed Congress, failed to be ratified by the necessary number of votes of states. Uh, Virginia just did this past year, though some other states rescinded their ratification. So that's going to be in the courts. But many of the goals of that have been uh, achieved by other legislation. The most active years of the women's suffrage campaign on Long Island spanned less than a decade, involved many more women than the leaders I've mentioned today. And maybe you'll find some others um, that haven't come to my attention. I'm always happy to hear about them. My book on Long Island women has a chapter on suffragists and many other Long Island women before and after them. And here that suffrage automobile on the back cover, uh, it's still available for sale. I even saw it in the, my local Walgreens. And I wanna show you the cover of our annual journal. You'll find indexes of all the articles published on our website, which I've added here on the top. Um, and one of, the, one of these days, we expect to have the articles themselves digitized, which CW Post has been doing uh, for us. Um, and if you look at the calendar on our website, you can see our past programs. I know there's a link to the program we had on the Web Institute there that you can watch. You can join our announce list for emails from the society that will inform you about future meetings. Uh, that is free to join the announce list. The website does provide information on membership and you can join and pay online. And receiving our annual journal is a benefit of membership. Uh, I think you'll enjoy this year's issue. It's now at the printers. Um, so we hope to have it before the end of the month. But before I turn to questions, I want to extend my special thanks to our trustee, David Doucette, uh, who is our engineer and tech specialist, and without whom this program would not have happened. And he gets credit also for choosing the music, um, uh, I Am Woman, at the beginning. And thanks also to Linda Greco, for her help behind the scenes. And let me go to Q&A. Oh, one of the, 
question, uh, Bill, I heard one of the outer buildings of Alva's Belmont Tower survives can be seen from the road. It's the entrance gate, I think, is what survives. Um, and, and the day I went to look at it, uh, the police were there within five minutes, uh, just telling you. Uh, another question from Jennifer Mariana Wright Chapman, an early Long Island suffragist and the founder of the Political Action League, president of the State Association, Quaker, and summer home in Sands Point. Thank you for the information. That's wonderful. And Bill, another question from Bill. Thank you. Yes, a historic marker in front of the old county courthouse, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Executive and Legislative Building in Mineola marking Rosalie Jones's parade down Franklin Avenue in 1913. Yes, that, that, uh, thank you, Bill, for pointing that out. Newsday had a big article on that at the time, and they interviewed me, and what showed up in the print edition was my hand holding the prison pin, as I remember. And Jennifer, again, is telling us that the Cowneck Peninsula Historical Society, which is the um, Port Washington uh, area. The website has a virtual exhibition on local suffragists, yes. And they even include Rosalie Jones in that. Thank you for that comment, Jennifer. Um, Myra Levy, is Edna Kearns related to Doris Kearns Goodwin? Good question, I have no idea. Kearns, of course, was Rockville Center, so there's a possibility, but I'm not sure. I hope I'm answering these live, that my answers are coming through. Um, Nancy Gessner, are there any records of local Long Island women who were members of suffrage organizations that are preserved and able to be researched? That's a wonderful question, and I wish there were. Um, I'm just trying to think. the. What we have are mostly um, newspaper articles. Um, we have no, there, there are some, Rosalie Jones uh, family has some records and the, the book on my bibliography by uh, Michael Jack has the, uses those uh, as well. Okay. Uh, Alan, do the colors and layout of the suffrage banner mean something? The, the suffragist, yellow was the suffrage color. The anti-suffragists were used red roses when they were in Tennessee. Uh, the, the suffrage colors the, for the women's party were purple, white, and yellow, adopting colors from the um, British suffrage movement. Um, and the, I also have behind me a, a, another suffrage uh, sash, which is just in yellow. Thank you, Alan, for the question. Um, okay, let's move on. Liz, thank you, thank you, Judy. Oh, wonderful. Um, and Judy Wellman, uh, National Votes for Women, Women Trail has extended its nomination period for markers from the William See Pomeroy Foundation to January 15, 2021. And there is a Long Island uh, uh, Women's History Trail also. And many of the, there are a number of suffrage markers which have been erected on Long Island, thanks to the Pomeroy Foundation upstate. Uh, one for the Pratt sister in laws in um, Glen Cove. Uh, the one for for a, a suffrage confrontation in Huntington, uh, the Samus suffrage one, and probably some more. Um, Alan is asking, why were some of the largest Long Island foes of the suffrage movement? Um, who were some? Uh, you know, I I don't the name I don't know. Uh, and, and the anti-suffrage movement, um, there is a book on, on that for New York State. Nobody has, to my knowledge, has focused on Long Island and beyond Rosalie Jones's mother and sister, 
I don't know who others were, but that's my deficiency, I guess. Um, thank you, Judith, for your comment. Uh, <laughs> and my friend, high school friend, Addie asked, does, does my pin mean I served time in prison? No. Um, okay. Uh, Tom, uh, oh yes, another Tom is, uh, points out, Catherine Bennett Davis lived 10 years on Long Island in Jackson Heights and a New York City leader in the suffrage movement. Thank you, Tom, for you pointing that out. I'd like the additional, um, by and large, I was sticking to Nassau and Suffolk, though I extended to um, Brooklyn for uh, Lucy Burns. Jennifer tells us yellow was from sunflowers, the Kansas suffragist emblem. Thank you, Jennifer. Is that the, oh no, Dolores. How many women were in prison? There were dozens of women who were arrested and in prison. Um, and that, that, that they were all associated with, uh, in, and that was in D Washington, DC, associated with uh, Alice Paul. And there's a good deal written about that, certainly. Um, I don't have a specific number, Dolores, but um, it's probably in some of the accounts of suffrage. And if you didn't see it, um, the, the vote that PBS did this summer, that documentary, it was four hours extended over two or four days when it was repeated and maybe on available um, on uh, their passport program or a presenting. Um, and what proportion of your membership are men of the Nassau County Historical Society? I've never looked to see, but we do have uh, a good deal of men. Uh, and my friend Tamara asks, who represented the pins to the women who had been in prison? I don't know who did. I assume it was probably Alice Paul, but I don't know for sure, but I should find out. And uh, I think that's everyone's comments and questions. And it came through within an hour. And uh, let's see. So if I remember what I'm supposed to do, um, I've got a couple comments. Uh, I appreciate all your comments and questions. And after you leave the meeting, there will be a one question evaluation form that will pop up on the screen and please respond to that. So be well, stay safe and thank you all for attending. I think we got off without glitches, wonderful.